Welcome to ID the Future. I'm Robert J. Marks, broadcasting with Discovery Institute's Center of Science and Culture in Seattle, Washington. This podcast is part three of an interview with Dr. Winston Ewart about his work at the Evolutionary Informatics Lab concerning algorithmic specified complexity. The first podcast dealt with the genesis of algorithmic specified complexity application of algorithmic specified complexity to Conway's Game of Life was the topic of the second podcast. This podcast with Dr. Ewart deals with the topic of using algorithmic specified complexity in assessing meaning in images. Hello, I'm Robert Marks for ID the Future. Today we're talking to Dr. Winston Ewart and some of his work on algorithmic specified complexity. Dr. Ewart's work is available on evoinfo.org. There's three papers which are written about algorithmic specified complexity, and all three papers are written by Dr. Ewart as uh, first author with William Dembski and Robert Marks, that's me. The first one is simply titled Algorithmic Specified Complexity, where the entire concept of algorithmic specified complexity is introduced. That's an engineering of the ultimate, an interdisciplinary investigation of order and design in nature and craft. It's edited by Jonathan Bartlett, Dominic Hausmer, and Mark Hall, available on Amazon.com. And again, the the reprint is available on evoinfo.org. The second paper, which we discussed in a previous podcast, is entitled Algorithmic Specified Complexity in the Game of Life. It was authored by Winston Ewart, Bill Dembski, and me. (laughs) This paper appeared in the IEEE Transactions on Systems Man of Cybernetics in April of 2015, last year. It's an archival peer-reviewed journal and is one of the uh, main journals in the area of uh, engineering and computer engineering and computer science. And that also is available on evoinfo.org. And we discussed this paper in the last podcast. And if you haven't listened to the last podcast, I would suggest that you go back and listen to it so you'll have better context for listening to this podcast because some of the concepts of algorithmic information theory were addressed there. The third paper, which we're going to talk about today, is Winston Ewart, William Dembski, and Robert Marks and it's entitled Measuring Meaningful Information in Images, Algorithmic Specified Complexity, also published in a peer-reviewed archival journal called the IET Computer Vision, and it was also published in 2015, available on evoinfo.org. Let me give you an introduction to Dr. Ewart. Dr. Winston Ewart has his PhD from Baylor University. He has written a lot on evolutionary informatics and algorithmic information theory and algorithmic specified complexity. He is a senior research scientist at Biologic Institute, and he is a senior researcher at the Evolutionary Informatics Lab. And so welcome, Winston. It's good to be here. It's uh, good to have you here. Last time we talked about the idea of algorithmic specified complexity, how it combined uh, the idea of Kolmogorov complexity based on context, and then it also folded in uh, Shannon information theory. Could you give a quick explanation of algorithmic information theory in 20 words or less? But assume <laughs> assume you're on your Twitter account and you have to... Oh, dear. Uh, that's, not impo- that's not possible, I guess. So, so do, just, just do the best here. <laughs> All right. So... Komarov complexity is the number of words, essentially, it would take to describe an object. So this is the minimum number of words it would take to describe the object. That's the Komarov complexity. So if it's hard to describe an object, it has a lot of Komarov complexity. If it's easy, then it has a little amount. Shannon self-information is sort of negative of the probability, the inverse probability. <laughs> <clears throat> so, I'm, sorry. I'm yawning for all you ner- non-nerds out there. Okay, go ahead. The idea here being that in Shannon information, something is more information if it's less probable. So if I told you that the world was going to end tomorrow, that seems pretty unlikely. If that actually happened, that would be a high amount of Shannon information. And algorithmic specified complexity takes the Shannon information and minuses the Kolmogorov complexity to get the algorithmic specified complexity. That's good. And we went so about we went we, we we gave examples last podcast about the algorithmic specified complexity 
of two snowflakes. Complex things happen all the time. So a single snowflake happening is no big deal, even though it's very difficult to describe. But two snowflakes has a great deal of algorithmic specified complexity. And two identical snowflakes. Two, two identical. I'm sorry, did I just say two? Yeah, they have to be identical. Two identical snowflakes. And then we also talked about the game of poker. And in the context of poker, how a straight flush had lots of meaning, had lots of algorithmic specified complexity. And then as the hands went down in terms of their power, they got less and less algorithmic specified complexity. So if you just got two of a kind, that actually turned out to have zero or negative algorithmic specified complexity. So the beautiful part of it in the sanity check of any model is how does it apply to reality? And certainly in the places it has been applied to reality, such as those two simple examples, as well as the game of life, which we covered in the last podcast, the more a, a model fits into reality, the better it is. And certainly the example with two snowflakes, the example with the poker hands, the example with the game of life as covered in the last podcast. All of these are certainly intuitively consistent with our ideas about what algorithmic specified complexity and meaning could be. Now, one of the things that you did, Winston, in the third paper that we mentioned, which was the paper published in the IET journal Vision, was application of algorithmic specified complexity in images. So how does algorithmic specified complexity work in images? Images compress. Now you've seen this, you've ever put an image in a zip file, it can become much smaller. Most images you actually come across are compressed because they're often being transmitted over the internet and such where we don't want to spend extra space. And if, because if you look at an image, it's not totally random one color to the next. Typically, if you have a blue pixel, there's a good chance the next pixel is also blue. The compression takes advantage of that in order to describe things in a smaller fashion. Now, it might be worth noting that in images, there's actually two kinds of compression we use, lossy and lossless. Now, we're here concerned with lossless compression, which means when I uncompress the image, I get the exact image back. There's also lossy compression, which says, okay, well, I don't need to get the exact image back. I just need something close enough that my eye has trouble telling the difference, but we're not concerned with that sort here. Here, we're concerned with lossless compression, where we can get the exact image back. Some images compress more than others. This description fits into algorithm specified complexity, which is based on the chromogram complexity, the shortness of the description. So would you say that the compression of the file was uh, an estimate, maybe even upper bound estimate, of the Kolmogorov complexity of an image? So certainly, yes. If you take a compression, whether a PNG compression or something like that, it's sort of an estimate of how compressible it is, how to what degree it follows a pattern. If you compress an image which is completely random, all pixels are just like totally crazy, you find it doesn't compress very well. But if you tried to compress, say, pure black image, that comes very, very small. However, if you have just a uh, an image of noise, it, uh, it might not compress. And if you have a image, a detailed image of a faraway picture of the Sistine Chapel ceiling, it would not compress either. So right. there's no meaning in there. Now, so, so technically, does... <clears throat> technically, the Sistine Chapel compresses a little bit because it's not quite as chaotic as noise. The key here is context. The reason that the Sistine Chapel can be compressed even more in reality is because in the Sistine Chapel, for example, you have pictures of various biblical scenes. You have primarily people and they're doing different things. Even if you just know what people look like, You can use that to your advantage, and so you don't have to describe what a person looks like in order to describe the Sistine Chapel. You can assume, oh, we already know what people look like, and just to describe where the people are and what they're doing. And if you knew the biblical or whatever stories that the Sistine Chapel alludes to, you could compress it even more. Because you say, well, this here was a picture of David killing Goliath, and you don't have to give as much detail about what was going on. Because if it was in the context, the person already knew the story of David and Goliath and what that picture would be of, then it lets them compress it more. And so the role of context basically allows us to compress these images even more than we could have without that context. Let me ask you this then. If, if we looked at an image of two babies and a toddler, and uh, if you showed it to an alien who had never seen human beings before, it wouldn't have much algorithmic specified complexity, right? Well, this would depend somewhat on the aliens. If the aliens are humanoid, they might identify it. If the aliens are gelatinous blobs of whatever, they might think, 
That just looks like a bunch of random pixels. Did you ever watch Third Rock from the Sun? I did not. Okay, well, they're, they're afraid of Jello. It reminds them of this aggressive alien race. And every time they seem Jello, they run away from it. So we're assuming that these aliens so, are like Jello. Right, so if, if the aliens are like Jello, okay. absolutely, they probably would see very little pattern to a picture of humans. Okay. Let me ask you this. I show you two toddlers and a baby, and I showed it to somebody that didn't know me. And when I looked at those two babies and the toddler, I would say, those are my three grandkids. Does that have more algorithmic specified complexity than when I showed it to a stranger because I know who they were? I have greater context. Sure. You have, you have con well, I don't know if you have greater context, but you have more context relevant to the problem at hand. So you, I can, you can say, these are my three grandkids. And you've identified the piece of information. And you know exactly who those people are. For me, I have to say, well, that's... My academic advisor's three grandsons. And that was longer. It took me longer to do that. So even if I had seen your grandkids, and I think I've seen a couple of your grandkids. Well, um, I'll sure. show you a picture after the podcast. So. <laughs> I, want you, I want you to always have al high algorithmic specified complexity when you look at my family. Okay. 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 Yes. So if I, it's slightly longer for me, assuming I've seen the picture, because I have to specify who these people are, and it takes more words for me to describe who these people are than it does for him. And if for a complete stranger, it would take even more if they'd seen him, because they have no particular special relationship with him. Okay, now when I show you an image, in order to compute the algorithmic specified complexity, you've got to know how probable it is. So how do you know how probable an image is? So that's not really my problem. Um, it's let, not your problem. <laughs> let me explain. Okay, so, explain to me why it's not my problem then. <laughs> when algorithmic specified complexity, we're, we're more concerned about specification, how we measure specification. When we're dealing with algorithmic specified complexity, we're not primarily interested in the probability. We're assuming that there's some other thing which is establishing what the probabilities are. So for the purpose of the paper, we adopted a simple model of saying, you imagine that these were random PNG files created on my computer. And that's sort of the model. Okay, wait, 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 wait. PNG files. Sorry, I was slipping into nerdiness there. Yes, yes. So I, I just about yawned, but I'm giving you the, uh, the benefit of the doubt here. <laughs> PNG files, they're like zip files for images. They're basically zip files for images. They're a way of compressing images. So the, basically, if you generate a random PNG file, you're likely to exhibit some sort of pattern to them. You're not going to get complete random noise you're going to get blocks of different colors and such. So it's sort of a model which doesn't say we expect everything to look like random noise, but it's also a model that doesn't say we expect to see pictures of people. Okay, uh, some people, so, some of the listeners might be familiar with uh, JPEG files, and you can't use your JPEG files for algorithmic specified complexity, can you? No, so JPEG files are lossy compression. They don't actually keep the whole image, and algorithmic specified complexity is based on the theory of keeping the entire original image. Right, the algorithmic specified complexity is not, uh, not specifically associated with identifying the object, but actually reconstructing the object or the picture exactly. Right. Okay, so that's, uh, it's not just pattern recognition or something. I agree probability is uh, not your problem, and now it's not my problem. How, how does algorithmic specified complexity actually work to measure the meaning in images, for example? Right. So the basic idea is you have an image you want to describe. And we're assuming that somewhere in your context you have a related image. And we're going to have to take the original image and describe how you convert it into the new image. And so that could be something like we rotated the image to fit the right thing. Or we uh, scaled the image. We changed the size of the image. Or maybe we added noise to the image, which case we'd have to specify exactly what the noise was, or maybe we kind of blended together multiple images. Any different way, any different kinds of these image manipulation techniques that we could use to describe it so that we can take the original image and change it into the new image. And the idea is that we then have to measure well, how much information did we have to put in to describe those changes, and that becomes this sort of the core of complexity of the image. And then we measure that against the probability to determine whether or not it has high algorithmic specified complexity. Okay. They say education is, is, has a little bit of redundancy in it. So what does it mean when an image has high algorithmic specified complexity? I show you an image and you go, oh, that has high algorithmic specified complexity. What does that mean? So on the technical level, that means that whatever model you use to establish the probability, set the probability too low to be a reasonable explanation of that image. So when I said this image was generated as a random file on my computer, 
If it is high AC, I could say, no, that's not where that image came from. That could be the image because the image actually has useful, meaningful information in it, like, hey, it's a person or it's somebody I know. Or it could mean that our model is completely wrong. Okay. Now, that was kind of a, a, a technical description. In terms of a high-level description, what, would, what does AFC mean? So high-level high description essentially is this doesn't look like it was produced by random chance. It looks, in some sense, it's meaningful. It's not just random noise. Okay. So it's a picture of two babies and a toddler. Yes. It's something that you recognize in accordance to your context, that a gel gelatinous alien from another planet would not right. necessarily have high algorithmic specified complexity. So how does this apply to Mount Rushmore? Mount Rushmore, obviously. No, you said you said Mount Rushmore. Did you say Mount Rushmore? What? I think you had a spoonerism. I think you said Mount Rushmore. It's possible. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what does this mean for uh, Mount Rushmore? So obviously Mount Rushmore is three-dimensional picture of presidents. Okay, well just say a photograph of Mount Rushmore. Or we could talk about a photograph yeah, of Mount Rushmore, in which case it images. is in fact a two-dimensional thing. And so the theory is, if I know what these presidents look like, I should be able to apply the same techniques that were done in this paper to sort of shift the image, scale it, adjust it, and blend or whatever to actually produce the image of Mount Rushmore, thus enabling you to describe Mount Rushmore in a short description relative to actually describing the complete image. Excellent. And what does this mean for intelligent design? Well, intelligent design has long loved the example of Mount Rushmore and sort of related examples, and it sort of develops further the idea that we actually can do these specifications, that we're not just making stuff up when we claim there exists specified complexity in these objects. And it exists to sort of provide a theoretical underpinning for those claims. Okay, wonderful. Now, let's just summarize things up. We've gone through two podcasts. One of the podcasts dealt with algorithmic specified complexity applied to the game of life. The second one is applied to algorithmic specified complexity applied to images. What is the takeaway that people should have from your work in algorithmic specified complexity and also Bill Demsky and I are co-authors. Uh, what, what, what is the takeaway? So, I mean, the idea of algorithm specified complexity is to provide a theoretical underpinning for essentially a probability argument. Lots of arguments in intelligent design depend on a premise that we can reject improbable events. And algorithm specified complexity exists to theoretically underwrite that claim. To say, this is why we can actually do this. This is why if we can argue that the bacterial flagellum is really improbable, why that's a problem for evolution because it has a high algorithmic specified complexity in that case. And it's why we can argue that it's legitimate to claim that Mount Rushmore was not created by natural processes because we can establish the probability and we can establish the specification. So the take home is that we actually have, based on rigorous mathematical principles, a way of evaluating specification and a way of actually claiming, yes, there is specification in all these objects. And if we can show that they're complex, that means that they weren't derived by natural processes. And that, I think, is the takeaway. Okay, excellent. So thank you, Dr. Ewart. I would, uh, I would remind everybody that there are, if you want to dig in deeper to this and you want to get a deep and dirty into the mathematics, there's three papers, all available on evoinfo.org. The first one is by, all three of them, by the way, are by Dr. Ewart, Dr. William Dembski, and me. The first one is Algorithmic Specified Complexity. This is a chapter in the book, Engineering the Ultimate, an Interdisciplinary Investigation of Order and Design in Nature and Craft. The second paper by the same authors is Algorithmic Specified Complexity in the Game of Life. That was the topic of the previous podcast, published in the peer-reviewed archival journal, IEEE Transactions on Systems Ban and Cybernetics in April 2015. The uh, third paper, which we discussed on this podcast, is Algorithmic Specified Complexity. It's published in the IET Computer Vision Journal, and it was also published in 2015. So thank you. This is Robert Marks uh, signing off for ID the Future. Thank you for listening. This is the third and final podcast interview with Dr. Winston Ewart about his work in the Evolutionary Informatics Lab concerning algorithmic specified complexity. This program is recorded by Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture. 
ID the Future is copyright by Discovery Institute 2016. For more information, visit www.intelligentdesign.org or www.idthefuture.com.